just pay a fee of 30 bucks and you become a certified agent place specialist. Believe me, I know. I had to take classes, I had to take tests, I had to write reports. It's a very long and involved process, but it gives me more education to help you. The National Association of the Remodeling Industry offers one on universal design. Again, it's not a quick and easy certificate. You have to work for it. The University of Southern California offers one on home modifications. Very much information given. And then there's the Accessible Home Improvement of America. They also offer a um, certificate for your contractor to get to, or it doesn't even have to be a contractor. Architects can do it, designers can do it. It's all about educating us and then educating you. Number one thing in your, con in your conversations with your contractor is communication. Communication. Oh, here, sorry, <laughs> went past the slide. Communication is very, 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 very important. So what are the things you do before you hire a contractor? Research what your project is by using the cost versus analysis um, by the remodeling industry. Ask your friends. <coughs> your friend just put in a new kitchen. How much did it cost you? And what did, did you get granite countertops? Did you get regular Formica countertops? Learn the vocabulary <laughs> that a contractor use. What's a change order? What's a license and insurance? Think about the design and materials that you want to use. Go through books, magazines. Try to pick out pictures of things that you like. It will help you communicate to your person that you hire what you're looking for. And one of the wonderful resources that we have available is your building department. Go speak to your building inspector. Ask him, I'm thinking of putting in a modification to my bathroom. Do I need to pull a permit? <coughs> and who needs to have the licenses to pull that permit? Um, as a contractor, anybody who does work over $1,000 in your home has to have a couple different things. They have to have, insure, they have, to have a um, home improvement contractor's license. You have to have it asked to see it. On top of that, if you need to pull, pull a permit, you also have to have your construction supervisor's license. So every contractor that comes into your home <coughs> should have two licenses that you should see and be able to look up online whether they're still active in using those licenses. Insurance. Insurance is a very important thing. When you talk to a, a contractor, make sure you ask for a certificate of liability insurance because you want to make sure he has general liability in case he catches fire to your home. And you want to make sure he has workman's compensation. Because if he does not have workman's compensation, specifically on that person that's coming into your home, and he slips and falls, your homeowner's insurance are footing the bill for his recovery. So you want to make sure he has at least general liability and workman's compensation. Talk to your contractor. Contracts are a very, very, very important thing. And I brought a couple of ones different for you. They shouldn't just be a one page. Oh, we're going to come in on Tuesday and totally re destroy your bathroom and it should be back by Wednesday or Thursday. No! That's not the kind of contract you want to sign. I have a couple of different contracts for you to look at. They should have on them home improvement license number, your federal ID number, your phone number, Who's your insurance company and how to make sure there's a certificate of liability? It should state in your contract what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, what are you allowing them to access or not. Again, communication 
and contracts. They're here for to protect both you and to protect me. I just need the bottom one. One of those is for a simple RAM, and I forget what the other one's for. But there are significant number of pages. And on top of that, I also have on my website some of the other pages that you need to look at and answer, some of the more boilerplate ones from the state of Massachusetts. Another thing you should do is we do what's called an assessment. We'll come in and give you an hour, an hour and a half, $75. I do have some free gift certificates for you if you are in, think you want to do it. And what we come in is look at what your project is. And we go through and see, A, if it's feasible. This is one of a gentleman who had a 100-year-old farmhouse, and they wanted to put a, bath, a shower in an existing half bath that once upon a time had a shower in it. And so while he was in rehab, we went with his family member, and we went through that bathroom. And it turns out, the way this old bathroom was, you sat on the toilet and the sink was right here. They wanted to put the shower here, and then there was a doorway here. Unfortunately, you put that shower in, there was this much space that you were going to have to try to squeeze by to get your toilet. So what we did is we worked up some other scenarios, because we will not spend your money unless it's going to benefit you. It's a very, very important thing to do. So I'm going to show you some of the different things that you can look through on this, some of the assessment type of things that we do. I want to thank you all. Now, now did you just learn some new things from this? Yes. This, was, this was one of the most, I, the reason why I wanted to come down is I wanted you, to, what, I'm not trying to sell Carol DiRienzo. No, it's she, but, 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 I, but I wanted you to get some sense of the amazing variety of things that you can do in your home uh, at all kinds of price points. And, and I think because of the technology, that's a, because of the new technology, those prices have been going down a lot. Just a lot of the electronics that you can buy tend to be relatively inexpensive. Now I just want to talk about a couple of other things. Oh, maybe I have to get the point. You want me to do it first? Oh, maybe I can even handle this. Hold on for a second. Yep. Yes. What's nice about all of this is that you don't need a lawyer to do any of that stuff. Obviously, you do want to be sensitive, as Carol had said, to the contracting process because just with, like with any job, you want to make sure that you don't get stuck. And, and, and the best people who are your referrals would be, typically on the island, talk to the billing department, right? They'll tell you who's good and who's bad, right? They often, well, they often will, right? If you're talking to them, though, what I think you're going, what you're going to find is that is in terms of your building permit and, and complying with the state building code, everything that she's talking about is all stuff that's generally allowed under the building code. The only time you might have some issues is if you're building stuff that's outside of the house. You've got three kinds of possible issues. One, in every community, you've got these zoning bylaws. The question is, if you're doing... If you're doing a sidewalk, well, it's just a sidewalk. I've never seen a, a zoning bylaw that prohibited sidewalks. If you're doing a structure, well, then there are setback requirements regarding how close that structure can be to the lot line. If you're doing the, that ramp that just ran off of the porch, well, what is that exactly? What is that? Is that a structure? Is it something? So you want to talk to the building department about whether or not you, you're, going to, you're going to be complying with the zoning bylaw. To the extent that there are issues here, by the way, kind of pro, more proactively, you want to be changing the zoning bylaw to make sure that all this stuff gets allowed. Um, at least to the extent that it, that it is in a house or around a house that has a disabled person in it. Um, and when do you need a building permit? I'm not going to try to tell you that. When the building inspector says you need a building permit. I know that I've, I've often used this line that, that about my... Uh, my uh, my daughter, who gave me a t-shirt once that said, the, great, the good lawyer knows the law. By the way, this, she's about to finish law school. She said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in the, in, in the case of this stuff, the judge is the building inspector, right? So don't guess whether or not you're going to need a building permit. Just go talk to the building inspector. They're like really friendly here. I mean, I've met several of the folks in each one of these towns. They're very interested in accommodating, especially for what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to make your house so that you can keep living in it, right? You're here, right? Um, second permitting issue is regarding historic districts. While in general there's very little zoning control, if you're in a certified Chapter 40C historic district, there are very few of those, right? I know 
I'm, I'm up the street, I always stay at the Mansion House, and up the street is the William Street Historic District, so I'm very sensitive to that. Then changes that you're making that are visible from the road, only changes that are visible from the road are changes for which you're going to need to go talk to the Historic District Commission to see if it complies. So none of the internal stuff is going to be affected by this, right? Nothing in the backyard is going to be affected by this. If it's visible from the road, you need to go talk to them, right? Um, in terms of how they're dealing with that, of course, one of the issues is that you've got historic districts that are trying to make sure that a particular neighborhood looks like it was during that, a particular period. Each historic district actually has a kind of a definition attached to it of what period they're trying to show. But in none of those periods was any of this stuff around, right? So there may be issues with the Historic District Commission, so you want to talk to them about that. I've spoken to some of the members. These issues do come up on occasion. One of the things proactively or prospectively that you may be wanting to do is work with those Historic District Commissions because they have complete discretion in terms of figuring out what's allowable and what's not, and whether it fits into the district. And these are the kinds of regulations as the population in this community ages, and of course as the summer population continues to be, you know, there's still a lot of reasonably, some people even older than me, that come here for vacation, you know. And, yeah. and, and, and as they're coming here, you know, it, it's an important economic development thing for these communities, because they live on the tourism industry, to make sure that you want to be here because you can have a house here in Martha's Vineyard that is being adapted. So I think we want to be kind of talking about, talking to that issue. Um, by the way, the third group um, that is very affected by this, and I think they have a lot of information that they could help these historic district commissions with, is the campground. I was at the campground yesterday actually doing a presentation, and afterwards I was just kind of walking around with Craig Lowe, who was the president of the campground association. He said their rule regarding ramps and stuff like this, because of course they have control over all exterior work in any part of the exterior of all of those buildings um, under the terms of the lease, because those properties are all on leased land. But in their rule regarding most of these kinds of uh, outside adaptations is they'll allow them as long as they are temporary, as long as they're designed so that they can be removed um, if you, if you, as a person who really needed that particular ramp or whatever, sell the house, right? Or after you've died. So that, so that they're trying to make that kind of accommodation. On the one hand, it certainly does affect, to some little you know, extent, the aesthetic of the campground if you've got a bunch of different little things like this that are out there. On the other hand, the point of this is to make it, to continue to be a very friendly place. It's this kind of amazing community and they're really trying to do that. That may end up being how you deal with the zoning issues and, the, and also the Historic District Commission issues. As you may say, as to all of these adaptations, well, we're going to agree that they're allowable um, as long as you need them, as long as the person inside the house needs them. Um, as, as I always, whoops, as I always mention, the goal of all of this stuff is to sleep well at night. If you're not concerned about any of these things, right, or if you don't think that you need them in your home, well, then don't deal with them. But if you are trying to think ahead about keeping that home the place that you want to come back to every summer or the place that you want to stay in because you don't want to go back to Ohio. I have a friend here who's lives in Ohio. Um, because you really like, like it here. Um, then these are the kinds of adaptations that you want to do. Now one of the key issues that, that Carol brought up was this, the payment issue. And that's what we're actually going to talk about in August. Uh, we're going to talk about different payment options and specifically different mortgage options, because you, if there are, I mean, I do a lot of work here, so I know that got, there are a lot of folks here who got very valuable property and fairly limited incomes, because you're retired, you know, you're not at the point, at least not the folks that I deal with, where you're still piling up money. You're at the point where you're trying to keep the pile from shrinking to zero before you die, you know. So we're gonna talk about that. So we're gonna talk about lines of credit uh, that can be secured by your property. We're gonna talk about reverse mortgages, uh, and we're also going to talk about the loan program that Carol was referring to, the special loan program um, that, the, that the state offers that will allow you to borrow up to $30,000 to make your, to adapt your home and about how you might want to connect that with some of these other things because that, you know, the fact that you're getting that one doesn't mean you can't get those other sources of financing, right? So we're going to try to talk about those next time. Um, thank you very much. Any questions for, obviously you're not going to have questions for me. Any questions?